What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Help Me Close Sales School, where I have conversations with sales leaders around the world with one purpose in mind, to help you and me become the best that we can be in the world of sales. Today, my guest is Chris Orlob, who is the Senior Director of Product Marketing over at Gong. I'm really excited to uh, have the opportunity to speak with Chris because one of their goals is very similar to our mission over at Help Me Close, and that is they're helping salespeople become better. How they're doing this is listening to literally hundreds of thousands of sales calls, breaking down those calls into scripts, and then using advanced computer software, analyzing those calls to see what separates an average salesperson from a great salesperson. And then they're sharing that data with you and me. So without any further ado, let's jump into my call with Chris Orlob so you can hear for yourself how you as a salesperson can start closing more deals. Hey, what's up everybody? This morning, I'm talking with Chris Orlob who is over at Gong, and he has some really exciting information, exciting data to share with us about how we can uh, become better salespeople and close more deals. How are you doing this morning, Chris? I am doing great, Max. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, excited you could join us. So first, uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us a little bit about who Chris is. Yep. So I'm Senior Director of Product Marketing at Gong right now. Uh, That's gong.io used to be the co-founder of a startup that actually competed with Gong. And after about 15 months, we ran out of money and decided to join forces with Gong and having a lot more fun doing this than I was doing my previous startup. Um, before that, most of my sales experience and sales background lies as being a rep and a regional sales manager at InsideSales.com. I have two beautiful children at home. They are both very charming. Get that from their mother, I'm sure. And I'm married to a saint of a woman. <laughs> I think it takes a saint of a woman to be married to a salesperson. So yeah. Yeah. I, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> so Chris, tell us a little bit about Gong. What is, what is Gong? So Gong helps B2B sales teams convert more of their pipeline into closed revenue by shining the light on the sales conversations that are taking place across the sales floor. Uh, most of those you know, sales managers are going to be blind to what's actually happening during sales calls. So Gong records, transcribes, and analyzes all of these sales calls with artificial intelligence to help ensure more of the deals that come into the pipeline actually come out the other end as closed revenue. The beauty of all of this is we can use this technology to analyze sales calls anonymously and publish that data for people to read to see what's actually working on sales calls, what's not working, what do top performers do differently than low performers. Yeah, I've seen that. That's one of of the things that really caught my eye is how you've been able to, uh, especially on LinkedIn and, and on the Gong blog, analyze data that you guys are capturing and then, and then share it. So how does, how does this work though? How does Gong, work? How are you capturing the data? How are you analyzing it? Yeah, here, here's a little insight behind the you know, research, me- research method. We get our data scientists to analyze this stuff. We have a small dedicated team for that. So every call is recorded using Gong and it's on platforms like Zoom, what we're using now, GoToMeeting, that kind of stuff. The calls are then speaker separated transcribed from speech to text and cleaned so the analysis is a little more accurate and then we run the data set through gong's self-learning conversation analytics engine to identify seller and buyer behaviors topics that we're talking about and other patterns we eventually tie that to crm outcomes like close rates and revenue so that we can identify what set of behaviors are leading to the best sales outcomes and we publish the data for the world to see, and it's been pretty interesting and fun so far. The latest one we did, uh, which is the topic that we're going to be talking about here, is we analyzed a little over 519,000 discovery call recordings, like B2B sales calls, and we found a bunch of patterns and trends that make top salespeople different from average salespeople and low-performing salespeople. Wow, that's... That's fascinating. How many calls did you say? Five? 
I don't know the exact number, but I know it's a little over 519,000. So it's 519,000 and change. Wow. And are you able to talk about where you're recording these calls from? Are these your gongs sales calls or? So it's an anonymized. Yeah, it's, it's always going to be anonymized calls from a segment of our customer base. So we try to keep it as segmented as possible. For example, we'll only analyze SaaS companies that have similar sales cycle lengths and other similar characteristics for a point of analysis to make sure that it's as similar as possible. Um, but yeah, it comes from, it's just usage data from our customer base. It's all anonymized, so nobody has to worry about any privacy issues or anything like that. Um, and it's kind of fun, you know, we're turning sales conversations into a science. I don't think it'll ever be a complete science, but we're changing something that's been completely art and gut feeling and intuition based into something that's part art and part science. Wow. Really uh, interesting stuff. It actually reminds me of um, uh, a chat that I recently had with David Hoffeld who wrote the book, uh, the science of selling. Mm -hmm. Uh, So lots of similarities there. And I, I, I'm seeing that as technology improves, sales is becoming less of a mystery of what makes the, you know, a, a good sales salesman successful as to, okay, we're able to break it down and turn it into the a science, as you said. Yeah. Think about marketing, like marketing in the nineties and forever before that was characterized by like the mad men of the day, like the Don Drapers who sat in their offices drinking cocktails until a creative idea struck them. And then they would put millions of dollars behind it without being able to like test and optimize Today, though, like the average marketer is like a scientist. They can hyper-optimize every word in their marketing campaign using analytics. So sales is going to progress toward like a data-driven discipline. There's still always going to be a level of art to it, just as there is a strong level of art to the marketing discipline. You know, conversations are never going to be a perfectly prescriptive uh, activity but there is going to be a strong level of data science and you know well frankly just data science brought to the the activity to optimize it yeah absolutely the way that i kind of think of it is like um you know you can take any art whether that's painting or acting or or singing even and you can know and understand the the different techniques and for example, painting, you might know the different types of brushes, the different type of paints, and you can have all that knowledge, but then to actually be able to apply it and create something, that's where the art comes yeah, it's, it's like Yeah, ter- it's like analyzing something so you can identify its structure and template and shape. Nancy Duarte um, did a TED Talk years ago about like the secret structure of winning talks and like speeches. And she painstakingly, by herself, analyzed the speeches of Martin Luther King and Winston Churchill and Steve Jobs and found out there's very similar characteristics between all of those like movement-creating speeches. So we're doing the exact same thing for sales conversations, but we're using AI and technology to do it so that we can do it at a much broader scale than one person could possibly do. It would be real interesting if... uh if you guys were able to take those same uh, speeches that she looked at, run that through your software and see where the similarities are and, and where the differences are. Yeah. We'll see if we can make that happen. She's a tough person to get in touch with, but uh, that's on my bucket list. (laughs) So let's look at some of the, uh, some of the articles that you've recently published specifically. I know that you guys did one um, on, you know, called the four tips for nailing your discovery calls and sales. Talk me through what that article was was about, what it was like, and, and some of that data that's in there. Yeah, so this one was purely about sales questions during this discovery calls. The following article is about like the structure of a discovery call, but just like you might expect, we found that there's a pretty tight correlation between the sheer number of questions a salesperson asks on a sales call and their likelihood for getting a second meeting and eventually bringing the deal across the finish line, measured by close rates. But we also found that there's a bit of a diminishing return. So the ideal amount of questions you should ask, targeted questions I might add, is around 11 to 14. 
once you go beyond 14 and start getting into like 15, 16, 17, your close rates start to decline just a little bit to the point of being average instead of like, you know, a high performing close rate. So that was really interesting. Um, I think the takeaway there is you should ask more questions, but you shouldn't interrogate your customers. It shouldn't feel like you're shining a light in their face and just peppering them with question after question. Now, we also found the nature of these questions matter. So how's it going is not going to close deals. Um, the algorithms, the machine learning algorithms that analyze all of these sales calls are also able to identify topics that are spoken about within sales calls. And we found that top performing salespeople ask most of their questions within problem related topics. So we call these targeted business level questions and they would ask 10.1 targeted questions per hour, whereas average performers would only ask about 6.3 targeted like problem related questions per hour. Wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. So can your uh, machine learning can it identify, for example, like that question, how are you doing today? And will it automatically take that out of the bunch? Or is that, is it including that as one of the questions? So it's, it's excluding it. And here's how we do it. When we hear something like, how's it going today? That section of the conversation is labeled as a topic. And that topic is like rapport building or idle chatter or something like that. So we found that questions asked during that topic aren't really impactful. But questions like, you know, if you were selling to Gong or if we're selling to other customers, a big problem they have has to do with sales coaching. So if we're asking a bunch of questions about sales coaching, that's when it becomes impactful because that's like a topic, it's a problem, it's a concern, it's a goal of the customer rather than asking them something really broad like what keeps you up at night or how's it going? You know, those are just too untargeted to really have an impact. So another example is like if you're selling marketing automation software, the more questions you ask about lead flow or I don't, I don't sell marketing automation software, so I'm making this up as I go, but landing pages or anything else related to like a problem a customer is trying to solve with marketing automation, the more questions you ask within that topic, the better. Gotcha. Um, and you guys also did another article on what a, a a lead call should look like. Let, let's dive into that a little bit because I think that's extremely valuable. I mean, lead call, basically that's, you know, a, 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 just a short step away from cold calling, which is something that all salespeople are doing. Um, what what should the typical lead call look like? Well, well, keep in mind, this isn't like a prospecting or lead call. This is a discovery call. So okay. we analyzed like the structure of the discovery calls. I already gave you a little bit of a hint of those or of like what should go into a discovery call, which is like questions, targeted questions. But our topic analysis also identified a very common pattern that discovery calls follow. And is they start out the first few minutes building rapport, like the idle chatter, t talking about the weather, or what you did this weekend, that kind of stuff. That's part one. Part two is the meat and potatoes of the discovery call. That's when you dive into three or four specific business issues the customer's facing. I'm going to come back to that number in a few minutes because it's meaningful. And then the third part of this effective discovery call is closing and next steps. So at the risk of sounding like Captain Obvious, yes, we should all be uh, closing and wrapping up the next steps and scheduling the second meeting. But we also found that top performers reserve a lot more time at the end of their calls to wrap up logistics. It's about twice as long, almost twice as long. It was like 1.9 something something. And the reason is you'd think it would only take like 90 to 120 seconds to figure out next steps. But every, every now and then, there can be a hiccup with that process. Uh, something, you know, a wrench can be thrown in the gears and it's going to take more time than two minutes to figure out what the next step actually should be. And if you only have two minutes reserved at the end of your call to figure that out, you're going to end the call. The customer's going to have to jump off because they have to get to the next meeting and you're left hanging in midair. Now you have to play this annoying game of email follow-up to try to get them back on the calendar and figure, what, figure out what your next step is going to be. That I, that is really surprising to me. I wouldn't have seen that coming. Yeah. Um, 
But when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense that the people who are having the higher close ratios are, are getting to that next step. They're reading the signals from the buyer and then they're just moving forward instead of dragging their feet, trying to get multiple uh, yeses or, or multiple confirmations that they're ready to move forward. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's, it's unrushed, you know, whereas like an average performer, they're looking at the clock, they have two minutes to get the next meeting on the calendar and they're like trying to rush through uh, figuring out what the next step is because the clock is ticking. Whereas a top performer, they're keeping their eye on their clock, making sure they're still listening to their customer. But they've got, you know, maybe seven minutes to figure out what the next step is going to be. They can take their time. They don't have to come across as like desperate. They can like slowly discuss and hash out what the right next step should be um, and get it secured on the calendar before their customer has to jump off the meeting and head to their next meeting. I wonder, um, and maybe you'd be able to answer this, is there a particular question that you're seeing being commonly asked when getting a next step? Yeah, I... It's, it's less to do with questions. So this is, going to be, this is going to sound pretty vague because there's so much variation in how next steps are secured. But we found that strong, top-performing salespeople, it's, it's less about questions and more about statements. Like they'll make suggestions. Their verbiage almost seems a little bit authoritative. It's like, so an example would be like, based on what we talked about on this call, I recommend the next step is we get your CFO on a demo so that he can evaluate the product as well. What does his calendar look like versus something weak? Like, can I pencil you in for next Thursday? Um, you know, I, I cringe when I hear stuff like that because it's, it makes the salesperson come across as frankly a beggar, like a lower status person in the interaction. And it, you're relying on almost the goodwill of your customer to give you the time of day, whether, you know, as opposed to being like, treating yourself as the business person you are and decisively recommending what the next step is going to be. So more making assumptive closes rather than. Yeah. I, I mean, a, assumptive. I, I've never thought about it that way. It's, it's been a while since I've thought about like assumptive language and, the, and that kind of stuff, but you are hatching some ideas in my, as in my mind, as we go, it's just more about, you know, communicating that you're a decisive person, you know what you want, you're going to be taken seriously instead of, can I please pencil you in next Thursday, please, Mr. Prospect. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we've all been there. And, you know, I, I, I'll admit it, I've been at that point before where I've been like, hey, we all have. you know, it, it's end of the month, and it's not a fun place to be. So no, it's horrible. It's um, gut wrenching, especially if you have nothing on the leaderboard. Exactly. So let's go back. Um, I think it was point number two you, you wanted to come back to and, and talk a little bit more. Mm. Um, yeah, the three. So uh, to backtrack a little bit, just to summarize the, the structure, the three-part structure of a discovery call, we've got rapport, we've got the discovery itself, we've got next steps. Within the discovery itself, like the meat and potatoes part of a discovery call, I mentioned you should explore three to four business problems very deeply. Turns out that number means something. If you ask about five or six or seven problems, your close rates start to dwindle. And in hindsight, that may be because you're spreading your customer's focus too thin. I don't really know. That's just the hypo hypothesis I have. You know, if, you, if they've got a couple really painful problems and you talk about 10 problems, those couple painful problems don't seem so painful anymore because they're compared to a bunch of other problems and it's kind of suffocating their seriousness. On the other side, if you only explore one or two problems, your close rates are also lower than as if you explored three to four problems. In hindsight, again, if I'm making guesses, that could be you're not digging quite enough pain. So the goal is you should target three or four problems and explore each one as deeply as time will allow. That's, uh, that's pretty surprising information uh, you would expect, or at least I would expect that, you know, the more pain points you're able to uncover, you know, the more likelihood that they'd be willing to move on to the next step. So. You may actually be right. Like, let's say, let's say you had two hours, which is unrealistic, but let's say you had two hours. If you have two hours on a discovery call, maybe you should dig for seven pain points because you'll have time to go deeply with each of those seven pain points. 
but the average discovery call is only like 30 or 35 minutes. So if you dig up seven problems, those seven problems are still surface level. You haven't had time to dig into each one very deeply. And this is just a theory. This is not like a suggestion I'm making. But if you only got 30 or 35 minutes, the, the most amount of problems you can sufficiently dig into is three or four. Okay, that, that makes sense. So, uh, Chris, tell me a little bit also about who should be using Gong. Any B2B sales team that sells either over the phone or over conference calls like we're doing right now, like Zoom, WebEx, GoToMeeting, JoinMe, all those big players. So it's, it's more for professional B2B sales teams that are trying to get more deals across the finish line rather than we don't sell to like call centers or B2C or really, really transactional sales environments. It's like, you know, SaaS companies are great customers of ours. Um, anybody who has, you know, unscripted but high leverage sales conversations done remotely um, can benefit from Gong. I mean, we've seen close rates increase as much as 30%. We have a customer called Correo Software. Their chief sales officer rolled out Gong to 40 sales reps and three like senior sales managers. 90 days later, close rates were up 30%. So if that's interesting to anybody, I would encourage them to go to our website. That's gong.io, G-O-N-G.io. Click the request a demo button and judge it for yourself. Wow, that's a pretty uh, high ROI right there. Yeah. Uh, an increase of 30%. Yep. So what, what's the future looking like for, for you and Gong? Uh, do you have any exciting new studies that you can maybe leak and, and uh, give my, us information on? Right now, what I'm working on is a very similar thing to what we talked about on this article, but demo calls instead of discovery calls. I want to understand the anatomy of a winning demo. So I don't know how long that's going to take me. That's like next on the horizon. Um, so stay tuned. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely be looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Chris, for uh, joining us today and sharing information about Gong. Uh, for those of you who are listening and watching, I highly recommend hopping on LinkedIn, uh, connecting with Chris there, where he publishes a lot of these articles. Um, I'll put some links for the articles that we discussed uh, here in the summary so you can read those for yourself. But every time I see one of these you know, articles coming out from Chris, I, I just get excited because this is, again, it's, it's not just opinion anymore. It's becoming a science. This is proven uh, data. And so it's not just someone saying, you know, well, I've had success doing this, or I think this is a good idea. This is, you know, literally thousands and hundreds of thousands of phone calls being analyzed, statistically accurate, statistically proven data helping you and me become the best versions of ourself. So fantastic. A any, anything you'd like to add, Chris? No, just thanks for having me on. This was a blast. Yeah, it's been fun. And uh, is there anything that I can do to, to help you guys out to uh, you know, bring more value to, to Gong? Just keep spreading the word about the articles as they come out. Sounds good, will do. Well, thanks, Chris, we appreciate it. Thank you. There you have it, closers. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation with Chris and learning about Gong. I highly recommend checking them out because this is just extremely valuable information. So go ahead, look down below in the summary where you'll see links to not only Chris, but also to the articles that we've talked about. And then if you're interested in learning more about Gong, I have a link there as well that you can click so you can go ahead and get a demo and start learning about how this product help you and your sales teams close more deals. Thanks for watching and as always keep closing.